Uh, and thank you for giving me the chance to talk at the same time in Ghana, Albania, Belgium, Georgia, and Canada. I don't think I gave so many talks at once ever yeah. in my life before. So okay. today I would like to talk about uh, some research I'm doing in algebraic geometry, which is related to physics actually. And I will talk about what I call skeletons of K3 surfaces. So the motivation for this talk actually comes from physics. Okay. So when people study physics, they realize that the four forces that we encounter in nature, electroweak, electrostrong, gravitational, and electromagnetic, where instead of having particles which are just points, you know, imagine the basic components of nature to be little strings. So objects are not anymore one-dimensional, they are zero-dimensional, they are no one-dimensional. They are like little ropes in the world that oscillate. And different modes of oscillation correspond to different particles. A bit like a violin. If you play the violin and you hit the strings, depending on the tension and the proper modes, you have different notes. So this is how strings get differentiated into different particles. So this is the first and very big conceptual slides um, that I hope you'll um, bear with me and I haven't given a talk before in this format of course so um, you know if uh, I, I hope because I can't uh, see any of you guys and you can't see me I hope that I will be um, interrupted you know you know as, as much as necessary to um, so that I, I know that I'm connecting to people and that you guys are understanding um, what I'm saying, so whatever feedback I get, we much appreciate it. Um, all right, so um, I'm going to be giving a kind of a survey of um, of the theory of quadratic forms, and in particular, some of the more recent developments in that theory. Um, so let me just begin by just setting the, the tone and going over what are the objects that we're going to be looking at. So. Um, so as you see, we're going uh, we're going to be assuming that we are that we're we have some given field. This is some field, and we don't, don't really need to make any assumptions in particular about it. It might be um, it might be the rational numbers, or it could be um, it could be the real numbers, or uh, whatever. It could be um, complex numbers and join some collection of indeterminates. Um, the only assumption that we're really going to make, which will become a little more clear soon, is that the characteristic of this field is not two. Um, and then we're going to suppose we have a finite dimensional vector space over that field. Then what is a quadratic form? So this is a form on this vector space. Uh, Q is a quadratic form of V if it is a degree to homogeneous polynomial function on the vector space. So uh, for example, um, if you have a two-dimensional vector space and the coordinates are given by the two functions x and y, so these are just the coordinate functions, then a, an example of a quadratic form would just be this, x squared plus 3xy minus 1y squared. So these are, um, the interesting thing about quadratic forms is that they're, um, you know, it's very easy to define. Um, and um, at the same time, there's um, surprisingly um, uh, questions um, that come up about these um, kind of very um, kind of somewhat naive uh, kind of structures uh, that might seem to be you know simple structures at first. So just. Um, to just kind of illustrate this point a little bit, um, you know, some uh, kind of cla more classical um, examples of um, interesting statements about quadratic forms is, well, for example, um, if you look at just uh, the form x1 squared, why don't I just make this, uh, forget about that one, x squared plus y squared 
plus z squared plus w squared. Then um, a well-known thing about this form, um, so this is not really so much about fields as uh, rings, or in particular the integers, is that every integer um, can be written um, in the form um, Q of V for some V um, uh, for a tuple of integers. So in other words, every, um, excuse me, not every integer, every positive integer can be written in that way, of course. And begin with my scientific method. These are a few words I would like to start with. In a completely rational society, the best of us would be teachers and the rest of us would have to settle for something less because passing civilization along from one generation to the next ought to be the highest honor and the highest responsibility anyone could have by famous industrialist Lee Iokaka. Okay, so here's the outline of my presentation or a lecture, whatever you feel like. First, give you the motivation why there is a need for finite element matter. So I'm presuming that at least you have been working in finite all the things, all the equations, all the uh, matrix terms, the right hand side vectors, so that you can see yourself how it is working. And then finally, I'll be presenting some numerical edges. I will be showing you from my desktop here, from my laptop, some MATLAB functions, basically, and I will be showing you some solutions. Watch it. Basically, the graphs being plotted, errors being computed. And finally, some concluding remarks. So, if it is going a little... That's fine. Okay, so here are some references. I think I need to take it this. That's better. So, the references. On finite element methods, there are numerous excellent books, not just one or two. So I have just listed here a few of them, very few of them which I have gone through myself or which I find really very easy or uh, best suitable for this kind of audiences. And they are in alphabetical order, not in the order of they appeared. Okay, there is one typo here. So the first book is by Professor Dietrich Breis from Germany. So Finite Elements Theory, Fast Solvers, Applications in Elasticity Theory, Cambridge 2007. Susanna Brenner and L. R. L. Ridway Scott, The Mathematical Theory of Finite Element Matters. They both are very good books on theory and with a general introduction to this finite elements. P. G. Charlotte's book, this is Sam 2009. It's not 2009, I'm sorry, it is 2002 and the first version was published in 78. This is considered by most ex experts as the classical book on the finite element method for elliptic problems. Then those who are interested in uh, interested in select like, implementing that VM, and even implementing the VM book, the finite element method by Gokenbach, from published from Siam in 2006. Then from one of the really the father figure, fatherly figures of finite element method, Barna Sabo and Ivo Babushka. So Babushka, Professor Babushka was among the pioneers who started working on very early on this finite element theory, 70s, early 70s, they have published their books, their papers. This book is also, I think, some mistake here. I mean, maybe I, when I was compiling, I made a mistake. It is 91. The book is from 91. And this Zinkwick, Taylor, and Zhu book, The Finite Element Method, Its Basis and Fundamentals, by published by Elsevier in 2005. So my apologies for these two mistakes here. Typos, uh, the Sabon Babushka book is published from 91 and uh, Searle book is from 2002. So I'll correct this and finally I'll give this to John and Nirash. Okay, so let's start with our first point. Why finite element matter? So consider the Poisson equation in a bounded domain, omega, which is a subset in d-dimensional domain. So dimension could be one dimension, two dimension or three dimensions. So we start with very simple model problems so that I can present the ideas in a very neat and clear way. 
Otherwise, you will be look at the, the oil characteristic, uh, the cut of the torus. Uh, this one actually has uh, is equal to zero. So if you apply a formula to the torus, so you see this term is equal to. Uh, so you see this term is equal to. Uh, Uh, is equal to zero. So this means either you have a k uh, is zero everywhere, or you have k positive somewhere. So that means you cannot uh, have something on the part that uh, the dark curvature is positive everywhere. Otherwise, you would have the positive number on the top from the top part here. So hello, uh, my name is Kasper, um from the University of Maryland here in College Park. So I'd like to talk to you about uh, strain theory, especially GABO uh, frames. Uh, hopefully by the end of the talk, I'll probably sort of uh, touch upon a little bit um, the theory of I'll uh, just briefly mention what it is, and uh, if you have any question, I can try to answer you at the end. Uh, I just want to check that you're hearing me fine. Uh, if you can let me know and uh, I can continue. Uh, uh, can yes. you hear me? Yeah. Good. All right, so the, the, the plan for the talk is the following. So, um, so I'll, I'll give a brief background on Hilbert spaces and I'll talk a little bit about our normal bases in Hilbert spaces. Uh, then I'll try to motivate uh, the introduction of GABO system um, by some called time frequency analysis. Uh, then I'll sort of uh, get to the core part of the talk, which is uh, to talk about what's known today as GABO system, give that definition, uh, talk about a little bit about some of the problems that you encounter when you work with this subject, and uh, how you can sort of uh, resolve this problem by relaxing some sort of condition about uh, your system. Then uh, I'll give you uh, sort of a flavor of uh, what GABO is sort of useful. And uh, I'll try to finish a talk with uh, a different perspective of GABO, uh, from, of GABO analysis. And uh, that will probably lead to motivating the definition of wavelet. All right, so this is essentially the, a, a small review of uh, Hilbert space. So throughout the talk, I sort of uh, work on the separable Hilbert space. And I just want to recall that a function, uh, a countable family of function uh, of, a of your system. And then if you take the closure of this set, then if you get the whole space back, then you, uh, the, your Hilbert space is separable. Uh, this is equivalent to say that uh, if a vector is such that its inner product with all the uh, element in your system is zero, then the, uh, the vector itself must be a vector. So that's what it means for a system of uh, uh, countable many vector in a Hilbert space to be complete. Now, I call the system to be an orthonormal basis if not only it's complete, but also it satisfies this orthogonality relation of the inner product between Fn and Fm is uh, the uh, delta of Mn, which is if n is equal to m, and which is uh, zero otherwise. So, one condition is just to say that the, the vector are unit norm vector, and the other condition is just to say that the vectors are orthogonal to each other. So if you have an orthonormal basis in a Hilbert space, then uh, for any function or any vector in your Hilbert space, you can write the function uh, in the following series expansion. So f is equal to uh, the sum of uh, f inner product fn, so you can view this quantity right here as somehow like the coefficient f when you decompose f into this orthonormal basis. So you decompose f into each of these directions, and then you just sort of reconstruct it with uh, the given direction. So not only you have that, but uh, the norm of your function is exactly equal to the norm of the L2 norm of a sequence of coefficient. So this is a very, very important uh, of equality uh, uh, because it sort of relates like potentially a function that sort of define 
to be like um, uh, a continuous function. What I meant by that is that it's a function that sort of uh, defined on the on the real line. It completely characterizes a function in terms of a discrete set. Where the Jonathan, and um, today I'm to uh, um, tell you something about um, Grassmannians and uh, the cohomology of Grassmannians and how you can use them to solve some enumerative problem, which means, uh, you know, finding, um, for example, how many lines intersect uh, a certain number of given lines. And um, I'm going to be, um, I'm not going to give any details, uh, but I hope that uh, I can convey general idea and, um, and maybe spark some interest so that then you can go and look more deeply about the things that I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, um, so could you just uh, also just expand the, you remember the tool to just click on it to expand it a bit so that it's the, the, slide, what? Uh, the slides. The slides? Yeah, just remember uh, okay. the, uh, the, um, at, the, at the bottom. More right than this? Side. Yeah. No, no, no. Yes. Uh, no, no, that's, that's uh, to, I mean, the other way. Uh, so uh, yeah. they're expanded already. Okay, okay, that's, that's fine then. Okay, then. So, I mean, this is the maximum okay, that's for now. Fine. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. <laughs> I guess it's, uh, I mean, if you want it bigger, I have to rotate my screen. Oh, no, oh, no, 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 uh, I think that's fine. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so okay, I'll start by um, recalling something about the you are uh, now muted. projective plane, uh, the projective space. So <laughs> the projective space is a, is a, manifold if you want of dimension n and so next uh, i'm going to talk about the grassmannian um so the grassmannian if you want is a generalization of the projective space the projective space is a special case of a, of a grassmannian there we were parameterizing so in the projective space we are parameterizing lines inside the vector space um now here I, I change a little bit notation instead of cn plus one i'm going to just use cn what i want to do is i want to see if i can parameterize all planes um, of dimension d inside the vector space cn and this is possible and um, what you get is another manifold which is called the grassmannians of d planes inside cn <coughs> um, Okay, so, so um, yes, an equivalent uh, description. So uh, later on, I'm, I'm going to go a little bit back and forth between uh, uh, CN and, and PN minus one. So if I have, from what I just said, if I have a D plane in CN, that corresponds to looking instead PN minus one um, to a D minus one plane. Um, so um, later on, I'm going to talk about uh, lines in P3, which corresponds to planes, two-dimensional planes in C4. <laughs> um, yes. Okay. So the Grassmannian also is a manifold, as I said, and its dimension is going to be n, which is the n of Cn, where you are, your ambient space, times n minus d, and um, uh, this can be uh, seen in a similar way, um, uh, so it can be seen the following way, which is quite similar to what we saw for uh, Pn, where essentially we took Cn modulo C star. Here we take a bigger group, which is the, the general linear group, so all invertible matrices, and we mod out by uh, a subgroup. So. <coughs> And essentially, the idea is the following. So if you have a d-dimensional plane, you can always find a linear transformation, so an invertible linear transformation. So 